reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. It's the story of the majestic glory of the King of Kings, as was revealed to Isaiah. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated upon a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holy, 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 God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled as with a cloud of incense. Woe to me, says Isaiah, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Reading from the writings, supportive. Suddenly the gate and the inner veil of the temple seemed to be uplifted or withdrawn, and Isaiah was permitted to gaze within upon the Holy of Holies, where even the prophet's feet might not enter. There arose before him a vision of Jehovah, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, while the train of his glory filled the temple. On each side of the throne hovered the seraphim as guards about the great king, their faces veiled in adoration as they ministered before their maker, and they reflected the glory that surrounded them. As their songs of praise resounded in deep notes of adoration, post and pillar and cedar gate trembled as if shaken by an earthquake, and the whole temple was filled with their tribute of praise. With lips unpolluted by sin, these angels poured forth the praises towards God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, they cried. The whole earth is full of His glory, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As the prophet listened, the glory, the power, and the majesty of the Lord was opened to his vision. And we pause for a moment in an affirmation of the things of faith, and we have been looking progressively at the ten, ten commandments. We have come now to the fifth of the Ten Commandments. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, which contains the full outline of the Ten Commandments, in verse 12 says this, Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's a good verse for the children to remember at the table when the meal is being served. But it's a good verse for older people to remember also. Because I read this. This is the first commandment with promise. It is binding upon childhood and youth, upon the middle aged and the aged. There is no period in life when children are excused from honouring their parents. This solemn obligation is binding upon every son and every daughter, and it is one of the conditions to their prolonging their lives upon the land which the Lord will give to the faithful. In the giving of the law on the second occasion, Deuteron Onomi, Deuteron Nomos, chapter 5, verse 16, says the same thing as the original in the book of Exodus. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Desire of Ages, that splendid book 
on the life and the ministry of the Savior. The approval of God rests with loving assurance upon children and youth who cheerfully take their part in the duties of the household, sharing the burdens of father and mother. Such children will go out from the home to be useful members of society. In the New Testament, Jesus said, Matthew 15, 4, For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother. That is the fifth commandment, the essence of these things. And we return now to the glory of the majesty. The majestic glory of the King of Kings as revealed to Isaiah. Now the majestic glory of the King of Kings as was revealed to the prophet Ezekiel. Chapters 1 and 2, a synopsis of some of the information there, says this. Ezekiel is speaking. I, says he, was among the captives by the river Chiba in the land of the Babylonians. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north. An immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. There was what looked like four living creatures. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. I heard the sound like the voice of the Almighty. And then there came a voice from above the expanse. Above the expanse, above their heads, was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above that throne was a figure like that of a man. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He said to me, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And in the commentary, upon the throne of the river Chiba, should I say, upon the bank of the river Chiba, Ezekiel beheld a whirlwind seeming to come from the north, a great cloud and a fire. High above all these things, he said, was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the appearance of a man. Above them, upon the sapphire throne, was the eternal one. And so thus far, in presentation, in the morning triad, the majesty, the majestic glory of the King of Kings, as seen by Isaiah, the importance of the fifth commandment, for all of them are important, and then the majestic glory of the King of Kings, as seen by another prophet, Ezekiel. Our topic for the day, yes, as is given in the bulletin, the advent of the Ancient of Days. Let's look now at the five occasions when the majestic glory, nay the hidden glory, of the grand father of all humanity, of all prophets, of all planets, when he made a state visit to the planet upon which we live. The book of Genesis, you've read this many times, yes, you understand it, and yes, you picture these things in your mind as you reflect upon the content of Holy Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is what it says here in the King James Version of Holy Scripture. And God said, let us make man after in our image, after our likeness, and let them have divine dominion upon the earth. You will note what the Bible says here. It is the triple plural. And God said, let us make man in our image. Obviously the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit serving together cooperatively regarding the creation of our wonderful planet and of the human race that was to populate this particular planet. Not only is this an honorific plural, but it is a plural 
of all three personalities of the divinity, the Godhead. I read, the Father and the Son engaged in the mighty, wondrous work they had contemplated of creating our world. The earth, a capital E, thank you, the earth came forth from the hand of the Creator, exceedingly beautiful. There were mountains and hills and plains, and interspersed among them were rivers and bodies of water. The earth, yea, same capital E, the earth was not one extensive plain, but the monotony of the scenery was broken by hills and mountains, not high and ragged like they are now, but regular and beautiful in shape. The bare, high rocks were never seen upon them, but lay beneath the surface like as bones to the earth. The waters were regularly dispersed, the hills, mountains and very beautiful plains were adorned with plants and flowers and tall majestic trees of every description, which were many times larger and much more beautiful than trees are now. The air was purer and healthful, and the earth seemed to be like a noble palace. Angels beheld and rejoiced at the wonderful and beautiful works in creation by God. After the earth was created and the animals upon it, the Father and the Son carried out their purpose, which was designed before the fall of Satan, to make man in their own image. They had wrought together in the creation of the earth and of every living thing upon it. And now God said to his Son, and now God said to his Son, let us make man in our image. I read on another passage. In the beginning, the Father and the Son rested upon the Sabbath day after their work of creation. So the first occasion when divinity, the supreme king of the universe, paid a visit to our planet, nay, to the empty space up there in eternity, which was not yet filled by our planet. The Father was present at the creation of our planet Earth. The next occasion that is given in Holy Scripture, when God the Father made a state visit to planet Earth, was at the giving of the Ten Commandments upon Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, says God, I send an angel, a capital A, before thee. And there is only one being anywhere in the universe who can give a command to the one who is the Messiah. Michael the Archangel, the baby, and the, uh, the one who grew up into ministry, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one being anywhere in the universe that can give him a command. And that was God the Father. So, this is what God the Father is saying. Behold I, he says, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Patriarchs and prophets, the Father and the Son, were present upon the Mount Sinai. Evangelism, Christ and the Father, standing side by side on the mount, with solemn majesty, proclaimed the Ten Commandments. I read elsewhere, when the law was spoken, the Lord, the Creator of heaven and earth, everything that's out there and then our planet, stood by the side, stood by the side of his Son, and shrouded in the fire and the smoke on the mount. Another statement, the proclamation of the law of the Ten Commandments was a wonderful exhibition of the glory and the majesty of God. The whole universe had been witness to the scenes at Sinai. Exodus chapter 24 verse 10, and I have read this to you on some previous occasions, it tells us that there was a paved work of a sapphire stone upon Mount Sinai, which was the, the platform upon which God the Father stood when he was proclaiming the Ten Commandments with Jesus at Mount Sinai. Creation, Mount Sinai, two visits from God the Father, the eternal Jehovah. 
The next one, which is given to us in the Bible, is found in the book of Matthew. Maybe we should turn this up. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, and we're looking now at verse 45. Matthew 27, 45. This is what it says here. Now, from the uh, sixth hour, there was darkness over all the earth land unto the ninth hour. And so from uh, the, uh, in this time period here, the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And uh, this is sim significant in the information that is given. Desire of age is many comments. The sun refused to look upon the awful scene of Calvary. Its full bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday, that's the sixth hour, when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Complete darkness enveloped the cross. Vivid lightnings occasionally flashed forth from the cloud. The angry lightning seemed to be hurled at Jesus as he hung upon the cross. At the ninth hour, the darkness lifted, but it still enveloped the Savior. The sun shone forth, but the cross was still enveloped in darkness. The dense cloud had settled over the city of Jerusalem. The fierce lightnings of God's anger were directed against that fated city. That's the supernatural darkness. Notice what else we read now. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. Jesus was upon the cross. And so obviously this is the Father whose presence is hidden there in the darkness. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with the Son. In the thick darkness, God vowed the last human agony of his Son. I read on. Again, darkness settled upon the earth, and there was a hoarse rumbling like heavy thunder that was heard. There was a violent earthquake. The earth trembles and quakes, for the Lord himself draws near. God the Father is still there. With a rending noise, the inner veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom by an unseen hand. The priest is about to slay the sacrificial victim, but the knife drops from his nerveless hand, and the lamb escapes. No longer necessary to sacrifice the sacrificial lamb. The lamb of God has been slain, which was prefigured by the sacrifices at the temple complex. We move on now to the next occasion when the great creator, the king of the universe, made another state visit to planet Earth. Creation, Mount Sinai, and Calvary. All international, interplanetary events of significance in eternity. Now we come to the third, nay, the fourth occasion and this is at the second coming. You might like to read in the New Testament the book of Peter, second Peter actually, and uh, this section of scripture, chapter 3, verse 10, second Peter 3, 10, tells us here that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, unexpectedly, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements, everything upon the earth, will melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. That's the cosmic geography, giving a description of events upon our planet when Jesus returns. Now, let's read what else is in the writings. Before the Son of Man appears in the clouds of heaven, everything in nature will be confused, convulsed. Lightnings from heaven, uniting with fire in the earth, will cause the mountains to burn like a furnace, 
and pour out their floods of lava over villages and cities. Molten masses of rock thrown into the water will cause the water to boil and send forth rocks and earth. That's the convulsions of nature at the time when Jesus returns. However, there is more that is attached to this information. And I read on in the, the compendium of revealed information. Matthew 16, 27. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And the Holy Scriptures are telling us the same thing. That when Jesus comes at the second coming, yes, he is the Messiah. He is our hero. He is our Savior. But above him and beyond in eternity was God the Father. And so great and so grand is the event of the second coming that the Father will come also upon that occasion. Amen. The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. I read in another statement, the supreme governor of the universe will reveal to men who have made void his law that his authority will be maintained. We looked at the fifth commandment. We've been going through these. The next time when we have the privilege of a visit here, we'll present basically the information from the sixth commandment. Very brief, but it's there. And here we are told at the time of the second coming that the supreme governor of the universe, God the Father, the ancient of days, will reveal to men who have made void his law that his authority will be maintained. At his second appearing, Jesus, the Father comes with his... I'm sorry, let me read it again. At his second appearing, Jesus comes with his own glory and the glory of his Father. Do you not read in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, 22, right at the end of Holy Scripture? John says, there was silence. I'm sorry, the reference is Revelation 8, 2. Revelation 8, 2. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Not only are there no resurrected beings, not only are there no translated beings left in heaven at the time of the second coming, not only are there no angels left in heaven at the time of the second coming, but there is no member of divinity who is there. So significant is the grand proclamation of the second coming that God the Father comes with Jesus on that particular occasion. A state visit by the ancient of days. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. We come now to the next occasion when God the Father visits planet Earth. This is the verse I was referring to, Revelation 21, 22, right at the end of the Bible. John says when he is looking at the new earth, John says when he is looking at the new Jerusalem upon the new earth, Revelation 21, 22, in a new literal translation, John says, I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, God the Father transfers from heaven to planet Earth, and planet Earth becomes the capital city of the entire universe. God the Father will be present, God the Son will be present, the holy angels will be quartered here, and of course we, as uh, transferred, saved earthlings through the ministry of Jesus, will be upon the new earth and in the new Jerusalem as well. There is another occasion for the, the information regarding the uh, ancient days, and that is the events associated with the third coming, the new earth, as we say, this is the fifth. John says, I saw no temple because God the Father and the Son were the temple. I read in supportive information in the writings, far above the city, upon a foundation of burnished gold, is a throne, high and lifted up. Upon that throne sits the Son of God. The glory of the Father is enshrouding his Son. 
saying the same thing as what we read in Scripture. I read also, the people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son in the new earth and onwards. Our world, our meager planet, destroyed in sin, recreated in righteousness, will become the capital city of the universe. Now we conclude this information regarding the state visits by the Ancient of Days. Creation, Mount Sinai, the cross, first, the second advent, and the third advent. These five significant occasions when the Father visits our planet and remains with our planet. Now we're looking at the Ancient of Days and the ministry of salvation. We look at this information just briefly. John chapter 3 verse 16. You don't need to open your Bible to read this verse for you know it so well. It's the most well-known verse of Holy Scripture used by so many Christians and used in an indication of the importance of the ministry of the Savior. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's analyze this verse. For God so loved the world, okay, for God, that's the ancient of the days, the Father, so loved supreme motivation, the world, our planet Earth, that he gave, not loaned, not a temporary time period, but a permanent gift. Jesus will always be encumbered with humanity. He gave, not loaned, his only begotten Son, the second personage of divinity, that whosoever believeth in him, a living, tangible faith, not just a knowledge of the content of Holy Scripture, but a personal, viable, living faith. The, 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 that whosoever believeth in him, the ministry of salvation, should not perish. Eternal death, gone forever, Push the date button. No resurrection. When the wicked die at the time of the third advent, when the wicked are destroyed in the lake of fire, that uh, the ocean of fire that destroys planet Earth, burns everything up, and then the Earth is recreated. When the wicked die on that occasion, that is the end of their uh, life event, the end of their experience. No resurrection in the future. They are gone forever. Gone forever. Eternal death. Gone forever. Push the delete button. No resurrection. But, and that's the meaning of perish, but have everlasting life, which of course is the resurrection and all the translation under eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish in the second death but have everlasting life. And so there are five occasions when God the Father, the Ancient of Days, the Eternal King of the Universe, makes visits to planet Earth. Creation in the empty void that was filled by our planet, the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, the experience of Jesus at the cross and at the uh, temple ceremony, the second coming when Jesus returns at the end of our days and on the fifth occasion at the third coming and he makes our planet the capital city of the universe. We want to take the hymn book in a moment and turn to our final hymn for our worship and you might remember that our first hymn was 537, He Leadeth Me and we are grateful that God leads us towards the eternal king kingdom. But you will note that the second hymn, final hymn, is number 125, which is joy to the world.